and make it a little bit bigger so it's now not to scale because that two is 0.1%. Um, and I'll those coaches, I, pardon? Can I yes. Do you have this broken down by division one and three? No, I do not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not for not for this. No, 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 but you can. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Quite, but I, I'm going to speak. I'll, okay, I'll speak sorry, to that at the end. I just, okay. well, I, I can't see the back. Or so this I is good prep that. for like a dissertation defense or something. <laughs> <laughs> throwing throwing knives at me. Um, <laughs> Line though. So in that blue, in that blue line, we have two coaches, and one is a, a male softball coach, and they're both Division One coaches. So that is, to answer your question, there were no Division Three um, out narratives, and then there was a Division One uh, female field hockey coach. So that is what is the n equals two. So and then also, even though to a less degree from the pilot study, fem uh, in the in the female demographic. Females are far more likely of themselves to be in this gray area, even though the numbers are larger and there are more male coaches. Uh, Percentage-wise, there are more female coaches in uh, the no mention of significant other. Also, in um, in this, well, I'll get into that in a second. So, the question really at the core of this research is why <laughs> is finding a homosexual <laughs> narrative in online coaching bios like a game of Where's Waldo? <laughs> um, and we really can only speculate as to why this phenomenon exists. Scholars have suggested that gay and lesbian coaches may self-police their sexual orientations due to fear of losing their job, recruiting implications, and homophobic backlash. It is also possible that the policing originates at the administrative level, um, as scholars assert sport is colored by institutionalized homophobia. We can also speculate why women are less present and less likely to have a significant other rep mentioned compared to their male counterpoints. We know that there are barriers to female coaches entering the field. We also know, per our last Tucker table with Dr. Lavoie and Aaron Becker, that when female coaches do coach, they experience the pressure of being a token in a male-dominated field. That pressure can manifest itself in women feeling like they have to go above and beyond expectations and that the spotlight is targeted on them and thus there may be, it may be problematic to have the dual role of coach and mother. Um, furthermore, lesbian coaches may feel like a double token and feel that institutional and personal pressure to stay in the closet. So, I mean, really we are interested in what is happening in those gray, in that gray section of the pie, I mean that yellow section, whatever, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, finally, th there were divisional differences in the content of the online coaching bios to answer Dr. Kane's question, and so one of the things so working at a Division III school and being a Division III athlete, I don't know how many times I heard people say to me, like, Division III is not as stressful, like, being a Division III coach is easy. I mean, I've heard that kind of, like, theme, and I know there are people in the audience who can say, no, that's not true. So anecdotally, we would say uh, that. But we had an idea that there could be divisional differences um, between Division I and Division III schools. For example, if Division III um, competition and the media spotlight is less stressful, maybe there's more space for non-traditional narratives in online coaching bios, but we, we didn't find any. In fact, 46 of the bios, and that was what I was gonna mention on the other slide, there were 46 coaches in Division Three that actually had no biographic content online, like you could not read about any of their accomplishments, athletic or personal. So that's something that is different at the Division uh, Three level. And also, as I said, we did not find a single out Division Three coach, so. Um, as a takeaway, oh, future research. We're going to talk about that too. Um, future research, and this is linked. This is I mentioned at the beginning. The representation of coaches in the media is something that I think needs to be taken really seriously, as they are a very real symbol of a team. Especially in terms of reading Portland in that study. I mean, her, the representations that were put on her in the media served to sort of reproduce and not challenge these homophobic stereotypes in intercollegiate athletics, and I think more can be done on that work, and just also <coughs> to see how coaches are portrayed in the media. This uh, second bullet point is very close to my heart because this is going to be um, the topic of my dissertation. Uh, I want to interrogate the gatekeeping mechanisms in intercollegiate 
athletics and on the websites and determine what are the standards and processes that sports information directors go through in creating the, their content. And then with that, to look at institutional policies and how power is structured in athletics is also important. I want to leave you with this kind of key takeaway and remind you, and Pat Griffith said this actually about Cheryl Swoops when she came out, that even though this is kind of a controversial topic, that any conversation is better than silence. And I think that that's important, and it's my goal really to shed light on this issue and with my dissertation to expand this topic and essentially to find out if the don't ask aspect of don't ask, don't tell is in fact in, in, intact in, your, in, in intercollegiate athletics. So I really appreciate all of your time and I look forward to questions. Good.